Uh, good morning. <clears throat> it's uh, quite early in the morning, Saturday morning here in Virginia, USA. Mm, I don't know where it is, what it is, where you are. It might be evening. So I don't know. Anyway, hello. I am currently listening to this. I talked about this in a previous video, Br Brill for Cells Nashville. Not entirely instrumental, but beautiful, beautiful record of uh, bluegrass inspired kind of stuff. Found this disc washer at Goodwill this week. Got all the disc washing, you know, disc cleaning stuff with it, you know, kind of cool. Including this uh, Zero Stat 3 gun, which is kind of cool. Take the static off. This price tag says three dollars and twenty-five cents. Pretty good deal. It's pretty cool. Um, I found some forty-fives, found some CDs, some DVDs, and of course some albums. Some of which I ordered because inspired by VC people. Um, discovered a new channel this week, John Bit Bob Boom. I loved his channel. I think it's great. Uh, and I was watching recently. I was talking about uh, El Bicho Feo. John, uh, the, the Wainer, Dave Wayne, um, he has this series called Cheap Heat, which is, he had like 90s, rather he had 80s jazz, and all kinds of, he's got like 70s jazz fusion, and cheap, cheapy kind of good records, and he talked about this, <coughs> John Stubblefield, I ordered this for, you know, very cheaply, 1986 on Enya, I played with Kenny Barron and David Friedman, who also are all great. Um, but uh, here's a picture of him. John Stubblefield. Um, I, I found this John Stubblefield CD last year. This is another reason why I love CDs. This is a German pressing, by the way. But um, he's an He was on a, a soprano and tenor sax. John Stubblefield, but I found this John Stubblefield album on CD last year for like, you know, nothing, like a dollar or less, and it was killer, absolutely killer, and I don't know if I have it out here, but uh, blew me away, and so this one's an even better Bushman song, great players, uh, Jerry Allen, Charnette Moffat, Victor Lewis, and Mino Sinulu killer record i think uh, if you're into if you're into you know jazz but it's 80s jazz and that's not something you know you would normally but yeah like as dave said that could be had for you know next to nothing um so i got some i got some pretty big record i got this record this is a pretty rare record of a german band called creative rock on the brain german brain label uh this band they sound like so it's it's horn rock. Hey, good morning, man. How are you, man? This is horn rock, so it kind of sounds like Blood, Sweat, and Tears, but just much better. Um, it's got the growly vocals of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, but the use of horns is very restrained. <coughs> Blood, Sweat, and Tears have this one song called "Go Down Gambling," which I I like best of all their songs because it's you know it's rocking, and that's what this whole thing sounds like, um, but just better. Creative Rock is the name of this band. Cool German band, pretty obscure band. I think because of the horn rock thing, you know, that's very passe, very out of fashion. Um, but man, they're great. That was really good. That's excellent. I got this, which is a pretty cool find. The Replacement Stink on the original Twin Tone label, 1982. This is an EP. It's got Kids Don't Follow and stuff on it. Live stuff. Not many of these were, you know, made, I don't think. So they're kind of hard to find. Not that everybody wants it, but if you're a replacements fan, <coughs> yeah, that's not not an easy thing to find necessarily. But yeah, I loved listening to it. Um, so I, I got this. Here's another thing inspired by the VC. Ron, at the Hogs, Hogs Ear Report, was talking about this record. Uh, this Neil Young bootleg which can be had very cheap. This is a, a French pressing of this. Cool label too. But you can see the French around the around the rim there. Um, 
live at the LA Forum, October 24th, 1978, Rust Never Sleeps era. Pretty killer bootleg. This, to me, is two favorite eras of Neil Young. One would be the acoustic early 70s song when he was writing all the great songs and stuff. Uh, like everyone knows, this is nowhere. Those, that's a great era of his songwriting. But then the, the kind of Zuma, Rust Never Sleeps era, uh, late 70s era is brilliant, you know, electric guitar oriented stuff. Anyway, I'm a big fan, and Ron showed that, and I, w I went on and just ordered one. This thing's in shriek wrap, in perfect condition. It was like 15 bucks. I think Ron paid that same thing for his at a store, so they're not expensive. But, um, yeah, really pretty cool. Weirdly, I bought this record for six bucks. Uh, this is a record I had in high school. Stevie Wonder's talking book. This is an original one with the, gr with the Braille down in the corner. Uh, this was like six dollars. This is this sold millions of copies. A very common album. Um, but I went and looked and couldn't find mine. I think I must have sold mine for like twenty or thirty bucks. Weirdly, like there are people who pay twenty or thirty, but this is a kind of album that um, can be had really, really cheaply and sold a lot of copies. Kind of like Thriller or Rumors or you know stuff like that. It's like there are. There are people who pay 20, 30 bucks for a record like that or more, crazily, but uh, if you dig all the time, yeah, you can really find these. <coughs> it's not like they're hard to find. Um, anyway, but yeah, I had this in high school. This one in Inner Visions, probably the best records he ever did, but uh, yeah, he's amazing, man. On the roads, is killer. I mean, it is. Actually, I like all of his early 60s stuff, too. I'm just a big Stevie Wonder fan in general. Uh, I found a bunch of CDs. Uh, let me show. I found I found this cool 45. This UK Decca, uh, uh, early rock and roll, Lord Rockingham. Hootsman uh, and Blue Train, Lord Rockingham. Hey, what's up? What's up, Cost? How are you, man? Uh, first released in 1958, so you're talking early rock and roll here, stuff the Beatles would have listened to, you know, I think it's, I, I put it in this deck of sleeve, which I don't even know if that's an original, if that's the correct deck of sleeve, this boxed deca, but I didn't have another one that was suitable for it. I had some old 50s ones, but I didn't know if they were right or not, I need to research it. I do have some old, old deca sleeves, uh, here's some old, here's an old deca one, which this is also British deca. This might be more correct, I don't know. Here's some US Deca, old 50s Deca sleeves. I don't know which one's which. I need to research it and figure out which one needs to go in there. But anyway, I keep these sleeves because I'll match it up when I find the 45 like I did here. Um, so sometimes I'm just glad to get the sleeve. Like in this instance, I, I'll, I'll buy the sleeve and, the, and an incorrect record. Like I got this Tiny Tim. 45 with this Amaret record sleeve. Amaret was a soul label. Doris, the great um, Doris Duke, recorded on them. And, um, so, you know, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll take it out and match it up. Um, Tiptoe to the gas pumps and the hickey on your neck, Tiny Tim. <laughs> uh, kind of fun. I got this picture sleeve of Fleetwood Max. Uh, Fleetwood Max Tusk. I don't know if I have this or not. I may have. I may have this. This is a lot of 80s stuff, you know, easier to find kind of stuff. The Talking Heads, Burden Down the House. One of their big, big hits, you know. The Beastie Boys. Crow is on Amaret too. I I do have. Cr you know what, man? Crow is one of my. To me, like was a great one of the great records i love crow i love crow i love uh, several of their records and like no one cares about crow but i think crow is a very un a slept on underrated i think crow's super cool but you know what do i know <coughs> it's funny zach i think uh, you and i have a lot of a lot of similar you know overlap a lot of times mm. but yeah so anyway um, I got some 45, or I got some CDs. I got this really cool CD. Jerry Cantrell, uh, from Alice in Chains. It's called Boggy Depot. Jerry Cantrell. 
I looked this up on vinyl. This, so he's from Alice in Chains. I got this in a Goodwill clearance area where like it was gonna be thrown away and I got this for like four for a dollar or you know, basically next to nothing, but uh, this is excellent. This is like a lost Alice in Chains record. And they had such a unique style. Um, he's great, this is fantastic. On vinyl this goes for like upwards of 200 bucks. A uh, hundred at least. <coughs> you can't you can't get it for less than a hundred bucks at minimum. Um, yeah. Hey, what's up, John? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, but yeah, pretty cool. This, this is one of the reasons why I kind of like CDs because yeah, I can get this for next to nothing. It's going to be thrown away. It sounds excellent. Uh, it was amazing. Um, I, I like CDs in many ways. I think 45s sound better than anything. I was I was kind of talking about in a recent video, like, oh, the convenience of 45s is an issue, and it is. You got to get up and switch them all the time, but uh, nothing sounds better than a 45. To me, listening to a 45 is like you're right there in the room, you know. Uh, you're in the recording studio, you know, but uh, it's not super convenient. Listen to a CD, it's like, man, I can just sit here for... 45 minutes listening to the same CD and not have to get up and sometimes you get in the zone where you're like you know especially after a long day man you're just like fucking therapy man I don't want to get up you know I don't want to do anything I don't even want to lift my beer to my mouth you know half the time but uh anyway here's a, here's another Goodwill score I actually wanted to find this at Goodwill and I did I was I'm, I'm such a dork. I was, like, stoked to find a record like this because this is a Peter Fonda movie from the 70s about outlaw country. It's called Outlaw Blues. He basically is, like, a hick in, in prison, like, in the South and uh, plays guitar and writes songs and stuff, and it's, like, a totally 70s D-list kind of cult film, you know? Um, but I like... I like outlaw country from the time, you know, so, um, and I like corny D-list movies, so, but this record is not worth anything, this is a, this is a basically a worthless record, I mean, I bought this for same clearance goodwill thing, bought it for nothing, you know, um, which is always cool to find, I'll tell you what I did find there, though, and this blew me away, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, not a famous record at all, um, the Philly, a Philly Armada record behind these cheap heat. You love the version of For the Love of Money. Sorry, you digress. Uh, you digress. John, thank you. Anna. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I made this little video outside of my normal parameters. Uh, inspired by Alan, Static Traveler, who had made a record, uh, made a video about um, eccentric esoteric records. And it got thought-provoking, so I, unlike the 2019 vinyl tag, it actually interested me. So I was like, let me, let me actually make one of those um, videos. And I just kind of grabbed a handful of things, and I showed a bunch of stuff. Like I showed this, Robin Kenyatta, and I showed uh, Aphrodite's Child 666, and, like, and I showed... I showed this album, I showed, uh, and I listened to all of these again. I listened, this is Pearls Before Swine, One Nation Underground. Um, on ESP, Tom Rap. I I listened to that again. Uh, I listened to this, the cheerful insanity of uh, Giles, Giles and Fripp from Cr King Crimson. Uh, I listened to this, Cannibal Comics. I kind of disparaged this record, which I really regretted. And I know Richard likes this record, um, very '60s record on Colossus, uh, and uh, I I don't know. Yeah, I. I as I listen, like some, I'm like, yeah, these are records. They don't easily fit into a category. And this is the same thing with this record, Philly Armada. Um, so this was like the house band of Philadelphia, Philadelphia International Records, Gamble and Huff's label in, in Philadelphia, of course. <clears throat> and uh, this is like mostly instrumental uh, and kind of emphasizes, you know, musicality and arrangement and stuff, and so it's kind of disco era, uh, but, um, disco fans may not get into this, because it's more almost like musician-y kind of music, um, almost jazz-oriented, but, um, jazz fans wouldn't like it, because it's too, you know, uh, 
uh, too disco-y, so it kind of falls in this sort of halfway point. But if you're a if you're a kind of a music nerd, you know, man, this really hits the spot for me sometimes. So there's this definitely was a great spin. I listened to this. I was like, man, this is fantastic. Uh, I really loved it. And I'm not a disc huge disco person. You get in a real commercial disco. Although I will say this. <clears throat> Disco is so unhip and so uncool that when I really listen to disco objectively, a lot of times I love it. <clears throat> a lot of times I'm like, this is really good, actually. Uh, because it emphasizes... What's up, Alan? I was just talking about you, man. Uh, emphasizes... Um, disco emphasizes hooks. It's very danceable. You know, it's supposed to be danceable, so... Uh, it can be real formulaic, though. But um, they're definitely great things about this you know you just picked up the vinyl reissue of this bill for sale nashville <clears throat> um this is a beautiful beautiful this is gorgeous man first thing in the morning ass crack of dawn in virginia it's cold and gray outside the trees are bare it's a rainy spring yeah this is hitting the fucking spot right here this is this and coffee man and getting it done for me this morning uh yeah what was i talking about um sorry i just missed somebody's comment i wasn't paying any damn attention um yeah anyway i, I so yeah i made that little video and um <clears throat> so I, I don't normally do that but it got me listening to a couple records that i don't normally listen to. in fact i got this this was a new record this is kind of a grail uh kind of a grail for me Group 1850, uh, Group 1850, Paradise Now, <clears throat> a uh, Dutch band. This is 1968. Um, I did not pay very much money for this. I paid $35 for this, which is very cheap, I think. So I had to jump on it. I later found out that there is a bootleg, which looks exactly pretty much exactly like this the only distinction i can tell between this and the bootleg is even though the label is the same it seems like the printing of the label is darker on the original that's the only thing i could tell this definitely seems to be old but then again the the bootleg could also be old so it's tough i wouldn't pay i wouldn't pay big money for this because i can't tell the difference between the i guess an original can be a thousand dollars i wouldn't know the difference so um, this is a beautiful psychedelic record and mostly instrumental and, and um, better musicianship than you would uh, normally associate with, <clears throat> you know, most kind of 60s blues based uh, psychedelic stuff. The Dead Wax should tell me. Yeah, that, I should check that. <clears throat> Here is the here's the label. Um I paid so little for it that it really doesn't matter to me. And it sounds great, so that's all that really matters. Yeah, I don't know. I need to check the dead wax. It says 1050-4. Uh, Some comments in Dutch, you know, on the on the label. Um, I need to check that. I need to check it. But anyway, here is the label. Yeah, it sounds great. It sounds wonderful. It, this is really good. Really cool. I love this group 1850 I think this is a kind of a grail for me and I'm super stoked to have it the price that I had even a reissue would be like that much so it really doesn't doesn't matter to me too much but um, <clears throat> I think it's great just fantastic I was talking about this and how this is kind of an eccentric record but I think that if you're talking about eccentric records and you're talking about psychedelia or free jazz it's like the whole genre of psychedelia and free jazz are kind of eccentric. <clears throat> They're kind of esoteric. So <clears throat> to say that something is eccentric or esoteric is very difficult for me because the entire fucking genre is. So if you're listening to free jazz, you're probably cool with that. I mean, you're probably okay with that. If you're listening to Sun Ra, then obviously you have a tolerance for eccentricity or you, you know, love and appreciate eccentricity as I do. Mm. But I was listening to this recently, and I, I, I was kind of not really talking about this, but sort of overtly, you know, in a circular way I was talking about this, but um, 
I bought this CD recently at the Goodwill. Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. Jimi Hendrix, John Coltrane, The Beatles, The Doors, Led Zeppelin, The Who, stuff like that. I've listened to that stuff since I was a kid. Listened to it for 30 years. And, um, and it always amazes me, The Grateful Dead. It always amazes me when I hear something new and different that I've never heard before. And so I don't know if I've heard the entire performance of Woodstock. And if I have, I haven't listened to it in detail. And listening to this, it's like... You know, one thing about Hendrix is he kind of he kind of starts with, um, it, it starts off on a basis of traditional '60s pop oriented rock, you know, Hey Joe and um, Fire, and you know these are basically like your standard rock and roll, you know, or even soul kind of songs because he also came from a background of playing with the Isley Brothers and Little Richard and stuff like that. Um, and then he makes this, he jumps off into this place where he plays these mind, mind bending kind of psychedelic guitar solos and stuff. And it uh, can get very eccentric. It can get very esoteric. I mean, he can get like where he's like going way off the deep end into the most avant garde um, <clears throat> mind bending territory. I think that that is the aspect of John Lennon that people don't want, that people fail to appreciate. And, and especially Yoko. I mean, it's like, have you ever listened to Yoko Ono's records? I mean, have you ever listened to Yoko Ono's records? Um, man, they're fantastic. Uh, if you're into that, <clears throat> if you're into avant-garde shit, Yoko Ono's records are mind-bending. They're incredible. Uh, and what Yoko Ono did for John Lennon is, like, John Lennon was hanging out with um, Salvador Dali and stuff. He was, like, fascinated by Andy Warhol and Salvador Dali. He went to art school. John Lennon was an art student. So in the 70s and the 80s, because John Lennon was famous, you know, he wanted to meet Salvador Dali. He wanted to meet Andy Warhol and kind of more avant-garde artists, fine artists, you know, and popular fine artists, very, very famous fine artists. And uh, he wanted a credibility as in the avant-garde world, but he knew that his own music was always straightforward. His background was the classic 50s rock and roll. You know, that's what informed his songwriting. That's what made all the Beatles songs what they were, was that these guys had grown up listening to, you know, Little Richard and, you know, uh, Hank Ballard and, like, you know, like all the 50s, you know, the, the all the 50s artists, <clears throat> you know. Um, so, you know, um, Chuck Berry and... You know, whatever stuff like that. You know, so uh, that that this, their song was always there are songs, the Beatles songs and John Lennon's songwriting was always kind of straightforward. Didn't wasn't avant garde at all. You know, but it could be, and uh, they and they wanted to be, and they, but he really wasn't that. Like even though they wrote some weird stuff, they wrote Revolution Number no. Nine, and they wrote, but essentially they weren't that. You know, um, Saint Vitus. This is an original 1985 on SST. Not in the greatest shape, they usually aren't. Any kid who would have bought this in 1985, it's amazing he took care of it even this much. It does have a, it does have this cutout corner, but you know, I don't care. I, it didn't sell well. Um, this was really cheap. The reissues were really expensive. So uh, this is Hollow's Victim. It does have this damage in the corner. But yeah, I think St. Vitus, if you look at their band image, they almost, they almost look like they're Venom, like they're black metal or something, and they're not. They're really very doomy. They sound more like drug-fueled music. They, they're they more like Sabbath. They owe more to Sabbath than they do to black metal, you know? I struggle with black metal. I still am not. I've never been a big black metal fan. I don't. The growly, screamy vocals and stuff put me off. Um, I'm not a true metalhead, I guess, in that sense. I'd rather listen to Motorhead and Black Sabbath any day than listen to most, than listen to Venom. Although I like Venom, you know. Uh, here's a band which is not really a metal band, in my opinion, Hawkwind. 1982. Um, 
just checked your group 1850 dead wax it is the og the bootleg has a completely different number oh thanks alan i thought it was an og but i ordered it from europe it was only like 35 bucks um the shipping was a little brutal but i ordered some several other things too so overall i thought it was a killer deal i mean i'm really glad to have this and i think this is a killer record and um you know I think a thousand dollars for this is totally insane, totally crazy. You're waiting at uh, you're waiting at an estate sale. Good luck, Rob. Rob, I man, you get out there and you definitely dig, man. <clears throat> you dig. I mean, that's the way. That to me, that is the best. The best scores you'll ever make are at the are at the estate sales. You know, when you're up early on a weekend with all the other sharp elbowed collectors and you're trying to get all the gold at the estate sales. Of some dude, if I ever die and my wife has an estate sale. Somebody's gonna get a fucking killer deal. Yeah, yeah, good luck with it, Rob. Good luck, man. I uh, I wish I had half the initiative that, that you guys, you were up at 5 a.m., yeah, I don't doubt it. Good luck, man. Um, you and Dylan, you guys get up early, drive all over, go to these estate sales, make the deals. You're motivated. Good for you, man. You're motivated. I, I can't do it anymore. I got too many records to just listen to. This is this is golden time right now. I get up at 6 in the morning. I'm up at 6 in the morning every day. Get up on the weekend. Sometimes the kids aren't out of bed till 10. That means I have four hours solid, uninterrupted, to make my video and to read my books and to listen to my records. Uninterrupted four hours. It's golden time for me, man. It used to be nothing. I used to do it all the time, but... If I had all the time that I've ever spent listening to listening to records, I would be. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. Good to see you, Costa. Good to see you. Uh, I actually got this. Hoping to get Nepenthe label Earth and Fire from the guy who runs a bookshop. So, um, I have some Earth and Fire records. I need to pull them. I haven't listened to my Earth and Fire records. Um, Earth and Fire is a great, great Dutch band. Fantastic Dutch band. I love that. Earth and Fire. Good luck with that, Alan, because those are killer records. Rob found a whole box of these Jamaican records. SEB, Too Much Confusion. <clears throat> Late 70s. Um, 1979, Canadian. So these are like Jamaicans who lived in Canada. <clears throat> they moved from the tropical paradise to the frozen tundra of Canada gotta go to work hey man have fun Zach um yeah SEB too much confusion really cool Jamaican record still in shrink practically brand new never been listened to I, I would think or very little uh, Rob found a whole box of these while he was out digging in Canada and um, it sold me one um, we helped each other out he had a whole box of them he wanted to sell and I wanted one so you know it was only like 20 bucks Although shipping from Canada is more expensive than it used to be. It used to be pretty pretty doable. SEB, too much confusion. Cool record, though. Cool Jamaican record. If you're into Jamaican music, I think this is pretty killer. Good production, too. Very good production. And that's something I should have said about this record. I don't know if I even talked about this record. The Streets Living Theater. This is like a worthless record, man. Like, like a $1 record, if that. This North Carolina band... Maybe three, four bucks. You could get this for like nothing. But this band, <clears throat> this is an 80s thing. On some label I've never heard of, Stendek Records. From Mooresville, North Carolina. Um, which was produced by Mitch Easter. The production on this is so loud and clear. So Mitch Easter was from the band Let's Active. And uh, Mitch Easter produced the first three REM records. So he produced like Document and reckoning i guess i don't know but i know he produced the song so at drive-in studios was like his parents house he produced the song radio free europe which i've always thought was a great sounding 80s song radio free europe if that tells you anything about this kind of college kind of art rock but this is ah, man kind of a killer record i mean like some songs sound like distinctly like the doors and other songs sound distinctly like uh, Blue Oyster Cold. And, I mean, you can hear the influences, but 
never at the same time. So it, it, it's very 80s. Um, I think this is pretty good. I mean, I was like fucking blown away. I was like, I didn't know what to expect. I was like, this could easily be a total turd. Um, and it wouldn't matter because I got it so cheap. It wouldn't matter if it sucked. It wouldn't matter. But then it wound up being great. And the production was killer. Like right in your face. It sounded like you're right in the garage with him. Um, and I like this style of production where it's like put a microphone in the center of the room and just and it's like you're there with this band um, and it's killer I, I think it's a great record I was really blown away and I'm not I never have been an 80s music uh, 80s rock person but I've come around to a lot of 80s rock lately um, there was lots of great music made in the 80s and I and I, I have to get over you know there's a lot of stuff I had to get over to kind of be able to appreciate it um, I think in a recent video I was talking about this record, the Shangri-Las. Killer record. This is a girl group uh, from the 60s. The leader of the pack. You've heard that song. That's how I fell for the leader of the pack. I like how they have like, you know, um, these two like twin sisters. They're like the back, you know, they're, they're just a killer girl group, you know. So New York, like do woppy kind of stuff. Um, this is fucking awesome. I love this. The Shangri-La. So I, I had this, and I, and I loved it so much, so I ordered this one. Also really cheap. The Shangri-La 65. Um, man, look at those hairdos. Yes, those are some killer hairdos. Um, yeah, so I was watching this New Yorker dude, um, John Bitbop Boom. You woke up with them in your head. Yeah, they could get in your head for sure. I mean, you know, great singing and stuff, so... Um, very feminine, you know, I think, very feminine, um, they got that female mystique, I don't know how to put it, you know, there's a definite, there's an appeal there, there's an allure there for sure, <coughs> um, John Bitbop Boom is this dude, it's a lot, it's a lot of rock and metal, 80s rock and metal, but he's this New Yorker dude, um, I love his accent, I just love, I love, listen, and, and I love how he describes metal, he's like, yeah, this isn't, uh, cheesy potty metal this isn't leather and studs metal they have an allure the shangri-las have an allure for sure they have a they've got some certain panache i don't know how to they're very alluring to me i don't know how to put it um uh yes so anyway he, he's like uh you know like acdc uh they're, they're not Dungeons and Dragons metal. They're not Leather and Studs metal. <laughs> I don't know. I like how he describes stuff. He's fantastic. His name uh, Bitbot Boom is his channel. Doesn't have a lot of subscribers. Now I feel like Andrew. I'm like, here's a channel with not a lot of subscribers. First of all, I don't care how many subscribers you have. I don't care if you have 10,000 subscribers. I don't care if you have 10 subscribers. Because it's really not relevant. It's like... What, it's like whether I like the person and their channel. That's what really matters. It's kind of like, honestly, it's like, um, well, this this book's a bestseller, so therefore it must be good. Not necessarily, because the general public has no taste. So just because a lot of people like something doesn't mean it has any merit. You know, it's like saying a lot of people watch Fox News, therefore it must be good journalism. No. A lot of people just don't know their ass from a hole in the ground, you know? It would be like saying, um, well, um, uh, a lot of people love the Spice Girls, so therefore they must be great musicians. No, a lot of people are just dumb. Like, a lot of people have no taste. Just because a lot of people think something or like something doesn't mean that it has any validity at all, you know? Um, anyway, but if you were in the industry, you would think so, right? You'd be like, well, this is a top 40 hit. This is a hit. This is pop music. It's popular. Therefore, it must be good. No, not necessarily, you know, not at all. But, the, but anyway, um, Procol Harum. This is in shrink wrap. I got this for a dollar, mostly because it was in shrink wrap. However, the, the record is in terrible shape. So what I was going to do was I was going to buy this and I was going to Frankenstein it with my copy so that I could put... So for a dollar, I could get the shrink wrapped, um, you know, jacket and see how this is just fucking trash. Uh, and probably just needs to go in the trash. Uh, but when I got home, I realized I didn't have it. I don't have this record. 
And I don't know how I don't have this record because I've definitely had it. I must have sold it. I must have sold my copy. I don't know why. Um, I might even have a, a copy in my cell boxes, which I need to look through. So I need to Frankenstein this with my own copy. But I did have to wipe this off. Really rare, really. Wow. Uh, I would say not at all rare here, in my opinion. Uh, very easy to find. This is a U.S. copy, though, so, you know. I could see why, honestly, why it would be more rare in the U.K. Because, uh, you know, they're very British and everything, and, uh, you know, it's kind of old and... Mm, you know, you're going to have baby boomer era collectors that would want this, and they probably have all the deep pockets in the UK, and I don't know what, but I think you have some killer records, Alan. I, I, the stuff you have, the stuff you find, especially the UK copies, that's, I would lose my fucking mind for half that stuff, but to find a US pressing of this, you know, would be, or like a US pressing of Uriah Heep, <clears throat> eh, you know, not, not, not that desired here. Not that it's that common. Like, I found a really good, um, there's no poster in this. No. So I would have to, I would have to get the poster too. Uh Yeah, no poster. I got to get the poster. It does have the original inner if that's the original inner, I don't know. Uh, it must be London. Um yeah, for a dollar, you know, it's okay. Um I'll I'll just have to I know I'll get another one. I used to have a quad copy that I know I've had multiple copies of this, so I don't even know. This has wider shade of pale on it, of course. Um, I guess they are touring. I, the, the, the owner of the store was like, yeah, they're touring with uh, with Gary Brooker. Robin Trower's not in it, of course, but um, I would go see that tour with, with Gary Brooker, totally. It's Jethro Toll, an iteration, a modern iteration of Jethro Toll is also touring, which I would love to see. I kind of look at this as... Um, Here's another uh, record I got this super cheap. John Lord from Deep Purple. This would be kind of a similar thing. Not hard at all to get. Like Deep Purple records, uh, Procol Harum records, um, Uriah Heep records, stuff like not not at all hard to find. It, it, you know, in my opinion, Rainbow is a little harder. Um, uh, you know, Judas Priest not not hard to find. Uh, a lot of British bands. You know, Black Sabbath are getting increasingly difficult. Uh, you know what I did? I found a Black Sabbath CD. Um, I found this Black Sabbath double CD reunion uh, for, you know, nothing. Uh, man, I really loved this. This was 1997 when they reunited. Um, listening to this, you know, I got this for like nothing, so listening to this, though, I was like, yeah, this is this is killer. Tony Iommi sounded great on this. It was tons of fun. Um, yeah, this was really fun for, for like a dollar or whatever. Um, I love Black Sabbath. Love Black Sabbath. Uh, I should be ashamed of myself because I really didn't listen to a lot of Black Sabbath as a kid. Purple Quad LPs are great. Totally different solos and mixes. Yeah, I don't have those. I, I would, I would probably buy. Deep Purple is a kind of band. I would buy like multiple copies of their records and stuff because I think they're super cool. Um, I think that, like, not that many people are really into Deep Purple. You know, they're not that popular, man. I saw them this summer with Judas Priest, and, I mean, after Judas Priest played, a lot of people left. A lot of people didn't bother to see uh, Deep Purple's set, and it was a killer. You know, it was a fucking killer, man. It was a great stage show. I mean, uh, man, they're great. Anyway, got this CD, Tommy Boland's teaser. Tommy Boland played in the James Gang. He played... Uh, with the Canadian band Roxy. He played with Deep Purple, Tommy Boland. <clears throat> he was from Sioux City, Iowa, but where I lived in Colorado, they kind of claimed him because he played with Zephyr, too, which is a Colorado band. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're from Sioux City, you almost have to go to the big city in Denver or whatever because Sioux City is not a big town in Iowa. But anyway, he is an Iowan. I have kind of said he was from Colorado, and people are like, he was from Iowa, you know, because in Iowa, you want every famous person you get because there aren't that many right but yeah um this was i do have this on lp in fact i've had multiple copies of this on lp <clears throat> if you're into 70s guitar rock you know this is he's one of the him and like rory gallagher and you know they have a real kind of appeal kind of like steve ray vaughn or something kind of you know but not as blues oriented more 70s rock oriented but yeah if you're into that kind of stuff you know 
he'd be one of the big. Anyway, this is really cool to listen to in the truck and stuff and have on CD. I really, <clears throat> I got it for nothing, you know. Um, so it was fun. I got this uh, also for nothing. These don't cost anything. See, these are like practically worthless now. So I, lo I love them. You know, they're kind of fun. Uh, because I can't find this kind of stuff on on out on vinyl as much anymore. Can't get the deals on vinyl. I mean, it's tougher to get. I mean, I I still get lots of deals on vinyl, but <clears throat> not at the real dirt cheap, like next to nothing prices like I used to. Guns and Roses Live Era, two CDs. Toward the second CD, you get into the era of Guns N' Roses. I don't care for. I'm not a fan of the use your use your illusion kind of time frame. I like lies and I like. Uh, appetite for Destruction. I mean, I, that's the stuff I like, you know. Um, I think Guns N' Roses is a great band, man. <laughs> really great band. Really fun band. Uh, and, you know, they, you could see that, like, when they were playing at the Whiskey A Go-Go and the Troubadour and all the Hollywood clubs and stuff, That's to me, that's when they were best. Um, yeah, I, I loved listening to that. I thought it was terrific. Um, so... I got this. This was still this was still sealed. City and color. It's pretty modern. I mean, this is the 2010s, probably um, 2015. So this was still sealed, brand new. It was like a dollar. My wife loves this kind of stuff, and I do too. This is more like modern, tasteful, you know, rock. Uh, but there's there's the use of pedal steel. So the pedal steel. I think in recent years has been kind of rediscovered how atmospheric it is and how untapped the the the, the conventions of classic country kind of really limited the potential of the pedal steel as an instrument. The pedal steel is a very emotive instrument. A lot of things can be done with it. And um, this has like moody atmospheric vocals and stuff, kind of like Fleet Foxes or something, but... Uh, it's very good, very tasteful, very good. The city, city in color. C O L O U R, spelled the British way. Color. Uh, I, I, my wife really greatly enjoyed this, and I greatly enjoy this. She has a, she has great taste in you know modern kind of pop. You know, I don't listen to a lot of modern stuff so um she kind of drags me out of my old man habits of listening to music that's at least 20 years old but you know that is really good i get all these kind of classic um well i get all these greatest hits i don't listen to greatest hits a lot this like this is great white's greatest hits and like cinderella's greatest hits i greatly enjoyed this by the way cinderella's greatest hits not something i would listen to very much but um cheesy party rock glammy glammy cheesy party rock from the 80s sunset strip stuff but basically you know the songwriting is like the basics of songwriting you know very kind of stripped down songwriting and a lot of it's really fun um i yeah so i'll buy these greatest hits kind of kind of records um i got this pretty cool blade runner i was talking about vangelis because i was show i showed this uh aphrodite's child record 666 vangelis was in this band and he did all these soundtracks like this one blade runner soundtrack from the early 80s he's kind of like it, 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 musically he's not but he's kind of like a tangerine dream he made all of these kind of sci-fi soundtracks and stuff which are kind of atmospheric I have never really been one to listen to soundtracks a lot. Um, but you know who used to do that? Nathan T uh, Turntable Currents was always showing soundtracks and stuff like sci-fi sa soundtracks. And he kind of got me listening to some of this stuff. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this, man. Especially when the weather was all gray and stuff. You know, this is kind of a... It sets a real mood, you know. Um, it sets a mood. So anyway, it's killer. Blade Runner by Vangelis. I don't know that I would want it. I guess like a vinyl copy of this can be kind of expensive. I don't know that I would really want that. This was cool just to do that. Um, this was also like nothing. The, the Flaming Lips 
Yoshimi battles the pink robots. I actually already have this. Um, but I didn't want to leave it there. Yoshimi battles the pink robots. Um, I think it's such a great 90s, 90s record, 2000s record. That when, when was it? Man, I can't even remember the year this came out. I distinctly remember 2002. I remember when it came out. Blade Runner. Yeah, that's a that was this was tons of fun, man. I love the movie. This was tons of fun. Um, I I love the movie too. Somebody in my last video was talking about how the, his son made him watch the remake with um, Ryan Gosling. I I enjoyed it, but I mean. It's kind of hard to beat the original Blade Runner, but anyway. All right, guys. I've gone on for 45 minutes. I don't even know if I showed all these records or what, but it doesn't matter. All right. Thanks for hanging out, guys, and I hope you have a great weekend. Everybody, it was nice catching up with you.